leave the mic for Professor Munir. Please, sir. Well, am I unmuted? Yeah. Thank you very much, really. I uh, enjoyed the meeting last week. Unfortunately, I had to rush for a procedure. I could not finish it. So tell me if the images are... Do you see it well? Yes, Dr. Munir. So good. So I was supposed to talk about for about aortic emergency, but then I changed gears last week because we aortic emergencies it's written everywhere, and um, we talked about it. I'm sure we can find a lot of literature. I decided to discuss something for the future, which is going to affect the way we practice medicine, surgery, and everything. It is artificial intelligence and machine learning, and specifically in healthcare. It is everywhere. It's in healthcare. The first time I was introduced to the subject was when I was doing my MBA, and the professor said, a lot of you will be obsolete because of machine learning. We didn't like that, of course, but then he showed a picture of a drone taken images for the traffic in Los Angeles. He said, three people lost their jobs here. The flight attendants and the helicopter uh, pilot, the photographer camera, and the station person. And they were all replaced by a drone. So it's why I said I will do that as part of the VOT. Hopefully we can interact. Before I go that, we were impressed by, was impressed with this meeting. We talked to Khalid and the board of Venus Forum. We are going to start our meetings like that. And it will be the 2nd of May. I'm sure we will use your help as we are going to need that. The second thing, I want to introduce you two things which I'm working with and on. The first one is the International Federation of Healthcare Thought Leaders. This is a new organization. It's international from the US, Germany, some actually members added from the Middle East, South America, to discuss issues related to healthcare and policies and advances and education. One of the ideas we came with, which was actually presented about one and a half year ago to have an online medical school. Everybody said that at that time it's a crazy idea, cannot be done. But now we are working on it to reach that stage. This is part of what we talk about the artificial intelligence and machine learning. The International Federation of Healthcare Thought Leaders is started in Harvard in the U.S., after a course attended by a number of physicians and uh, leaders in healthcare, one of the committees, education, the other committee is artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. I lead that committee with another person from Europe and hopefully will come with a lot of ideas in that. Another company that we are working with is called Surgisphere that is introduced, built, and established by a vascular surgeon. His name is Sapan Desai. And we met about two years ago, and we found that we have the same interest in artificial intelligence, and we started writing papers together. One of the papers we wrote about how to predict mortality in COVID virus, and it's going to be published soon in the New England Journal of Medicine, and another paper in The Lancet. So only we could do that because of artificial intelligence. This is my introduction. Amazon, Netflix, all of them are artificial intelligence. You notice actually, and machine learning, if you go buy something from Amazon, the first thing it will tell you, it will show you everything related to that uh, thing you were looking for. Not only that, go open your Twitter after that, and you will see all those ads related to what you were looking on Amazon if you use your phone, or if you use your actually even email, that is the same email for the um, uh, for the Twitter, the same as for the Facebook, and they keep repeating themselves. This PowerPoint, when I was doing it, the machine, which is the computer, kept telling me these are the suggestions how to do your PowerPoint. So this is machine learning also. 
I suggest actually that we all bright people being in this field should know something called average is over. So in the past, we could live if we are an average person. The COVID virus problem produced the evidence now, average is over. So there, the other one is the fourth industrial revolution. It is not oil. It is not technology. The industrial revolution is actually data. So the future is data or data, it depends if you are from the US or from England. And the problem data is going to be much more with the 5G. The problem with data also is going to be a huge number. It's like oil, but the problem is what to do with that data. That's why we need really to know what to do with that data. In 2016, Schwab Close wrote in his book that these are the jobs that will be impacted uh, by machine learning, automation and machine learning. And these jobs uh, include telemarketing, tax preparation, etc., which means he thinks in a few years, 99% of telemarketers will be machines. Guess what? We are close to that. And these are the other ones. So I'm going to talk in this outline. Um, these are the subject, and I will introduce a study we are submitting actually to JAMA again um, uh, about machine learning that we came up with in, in here in the uh, with our division in uh, the U.S. Let's take a scenario: a 40-year-old patient come with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, no guarding, tenderness, fever. In the past, you see the patient in the ER, do X-ray abdomen, repeat exam do CBC, admit the patient, keep examining the patient, et cetera, et cetera. Nowadays, you do the CAT scan in the ER, admit the patient until the patient is seen by the attending, and you get the report from radiologist. Then you decide, should you go to surgery, no surgery, or repeat the CT scan? You know what's the future? You do the CT scan in the ER, you get the report in five seconds, and you get also a report telling you go to surgery, patient doesn't need surgery. That is machine learning, that's artificial intelligence, which means it uses a huge number of data and put them in a machine, somebody process that data and then produce an output. And that processing through a process called algorithm building and negotiation. That's what you need to do. You need a very, very, very good statistician to do that. That's all what you need, but also you need a huge amount of data. It is the ability of the computer to approximate conclusions for you, and it has its advantages, it has its problem. So without the human input, this machine will not work. This is one issue. But the human input is the problem because actually the human input can be a problem. If you want to cause damage, you can cause damage. If you can help, you can help. So in medicine, artificial intelligence in medicine is used in issues of great interest for people that needs a lot of data. What's made it also possible because we have the EMRs. Everybody is putting data on those EMRs, like the surge sphere that my friend Desai has. There's 1,000 hospitals in that company giving their data, and we are looking for more. Actually, we are looking to increase them from Europe, the Middle East. I'm not a partner of that company. I'm just helping him because of research. So anybody who has an EMR data in any hospital wants to be part of it, just email me, and we will. it is free. No money paid at all. So you put all the data, images, and come up with the conclusion. So it has many phases. The first phase is the input, and that applies to all inputs, garbage in, garbage out. So you have to decide what data you are going to do. Then you have to confirm epidemiologically that this data is proper, and then <clears throat> do statistical confirmation or analysis, then produce the algorithm, then you produce the output. 
So this is in a simplified form what it is. The process of the machine is what we call algorithm formation. We call those algorithms really as black boxes because it's a secret for any machine. Are they independent thinkers, the machine? The answer is no. So far, of course, they might become in the future, but they are not independent. We need data. We need uh, intelligence of the people who are running those data. But the more the data you produce, the more the intelligence. So it is not autonomous creative. It is actually spontaneously can produce result if you ask it, but it will not produce it unless you ask the result and cannot determine a new way to respond to anything unless you decide as a human how to do it. But I guess in the future, all this is going to change. When I say the future, it's very fast. It's coming actually soon. So why we call it artificial intelligence? It's a trying to do what the human being cognitive functions is doing, but the problem is still needs a human being. This is one issue. The advantage though, it is multiple layers millions of times faster than a human being. So it takes different data, both them together, and then give you some information. So that's what we call a paradigm shift in healthcare. And it's coming whether we like it or not. They are not independent, but I say they will be independent in the future. If you look in, in artificial intelligence, actually many people started writing about that. This is the way it goes. So you have the input for the data, then somebody will come with the statistics like that. And that statistics is the area which we call the algorithm in the middle. Then it gives you output. Use this output, which is information to come to your outcome. Sometimes it's not one layer. It's multiple layers, like not only one statistics, one to the other to the other, and we keep this, we call this deep learning because it becomes like the human brain from one layer to the other until you go to the decision process. And the more the layers, the more difficult it is, but the more accurate and the data and the more uh, usable the data. And it is a very complex process. And look at the number of articles in the literature coming about artificial intelligence. Hardly any article 2013 is about 20, 25 articles. In 2016, there were 216 articles. I bet you now it's more uh, 250 articles, it's thousands of articles now. And these are the areas that artificial intelligence is, uh, different languages they use. We don't need to go through that. Um, the problem is, is it a black box? Yes, it is a black box. It is a black box and it can be inscrutable, which means nobody knows how it was done. Even it is unsupervised learning can give you information, but you don't know how it will come that information. Decide, you can decide what to predict. You can manipulate the data. You can actually decide the result in advance, if you want to do that, and this is danger in it. For example, you can actually trick the, the data, especially if it is images, like in one of the Google experiments, the goats were thought it's dogs because you need more data to say the information. I'm sure many of you um, were watching the COVID in China when the police were having those uh, helmets on them, which can actually tell the name of the pe person, where he lives, and if he has fever without touching them. This is, again, artificial intelligence, millions, billions of data giving you information. The problem, this algorithm is a black box. Nobody is ready to release that for you, because once you release it, anybody can reproduce it. This is where the danger is. You can decide what to do with that black box. You can get a real output, but if you can have a destructive output, you can get a destructive output. Any question now? This is the introduction. Did I lose you? Uh, uh, I, I'll... Uh, take the chance to 
see what's going on. Yes, Samuel, please. I think the most advanced, you know, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence now is an autopilot, you know. I think it's a big example of, you know, intellig uh, artificial intelligence. But the problem with intelligent intelligence, they cannot go out of their comfort zone, which is the data. They have a data and they, whatever the data tells them, they get conclusion. And That's this true. is different from a human being. Human being, no. Sometimes data different, but the feeling, you have a feeling, you have like... So we will cover that. Different. We will cover that in this part. Yes, you are right. Okay. All right. Yes. I will wait. Sorry. Sorry. Sir. So then perhaps I can continue until we go to a stop before our study. No, I there is the question, uh, uh, Professor Munir. Yes, sir. Yes. A question from uh, Dr. Ayman al -Asir. He said, Robotic EVAR um, looks to have an important role in the future. Do you like to report on using robotic arm in fenestrated EVAR? So, so I'm coming to the vascular uses. One of them actually endovascular in, in general can do that. Like Magellan, you, I'm sure many of you know about the Magellan robot. You sit in your control room and they do the procedure for you. Okay. You just, you just draw the map to go to a renal artery, draw the map on it, and you sit, the wire goes in, the stint, there's nothing difficult. Any angle is okay. As long as you draw the wire, the machine does it. Okay, brilliant. If any of the panelists uh, have a question, uh, there is a command, just raise your hand, and then the mic will open. The mic is open for Professor Mahmoud Salah. Do you like to ask a question, Professor Mahmoud? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, can hear you very well. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's nice to hear you, Munir. Oh, thank uh, you, Mahmoud. Sorry we could not see each other. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, last time I was in the States, I met uh, uh, a guy who was working in the artificial intelligence, and he mentioned to me, we had a long discussion about this, he mentioned that uh, in the States they reached a dangerous point that the machines are collecting data and they don't know what the machines will do with this data. The machines are getting the data by itself. I, I, I couldn't understand this or I couldn't even imagine. So do you have any comment about this? So, of course, I cannot tell you the, all the secrets about it because these are secrets for the companies. But I can tell you, yes, they are collecting data as we talk now. Somebody know that we are talking. Actually, you don't have to open your camera to be seen. Um, and the data is collected in large volumes. But as I said at the beginning, nobody knows what to do with it until somebody comes with an idea. Then it can be used. Yes, you're right. And you know the future coming with those uh, chips that will go under your skin? You are done. We are all done. It has to go. Otherwise, you cannot go to the bank. You cannot. Do, these are all machines, actually. Yeah. Okay. We so, can continue the second part of your great lecture. So we will talk about then some uh, areas. One of the areas that is started with that needs a lot of data genes. So, you know, we go look for the gene for cancer, gene for uh, atherosclerosis. And then when I defy a gene and we think we had all the knowledge, the problem with genes is there are millions of them, millions of combination. There's no way on earth one gene can be controlling everything. This is where genomics actually can be fully held and served by machine learning. But sometimes the data variations cause a problem and you can reach actually uh, erroneous conclusions like this in a study, they could not actually continue with the study because the machine learning give, uh, gave the wrong interpretation and uh, the wrong recommendation for chemotherapy and they canceled the study. Um, so uh, the problem if you don't decide on the equations very well, you get the wrong uh, data on those cases. Um, how can we trust the machine? We have to trust the machine because now it's coming in the future with all decisions done and made by the machines. Yes, it can be abused, but anything in life can be abused. So the standard we will use is still, I keep saying is a black box. Actually, even in medicine is becoming a black box. Um, nowadays, we know the machine defeated the standard of medicine. 
and the standard of many uh, areas like chess machine is better than a human, Jeopardy better than humans, low labor machine automation, furniture assembly, investment advice, all these can be done by machine. Imagine for investment advice, you go to a human being based on some data, give you an advice, but the machine can collect much more data. If you go to um, a factory, you have one or two only workers in the whole factory, everything is like a machine. In medicine, these are the areas where there is a lot um, uh, that's going imaging, dermatology, diagnostic, pathology, ophthalmology, drug discovery, investment in medicine also advice is going like which company you need to go to invest in because they have a future in medicine. Devices for monitoring health and for delivering a treatment, we know the wearables, they are all over. For example, a study done in Ontario, they found the machine predicted with high accuracy infection in the premature infants much earlier, about 48 hours before infection occurred. So they managed to predict that this neonate will get infection. No human being could do that, except based to some extent, perhaps based some criteria you might. So the researchers do not know how, but the machine managed to do that actually and determine the uh, onset of infection, which is very uh, abnormal. We are a build device. I'm part of a study actually. I'm a, a, the, one of the companies came and gave us watches, gave us iPads. They want us to try it. We took it. So these wearable devices that they can predict what will happen to you. So they can monitor you. The company is in Colorado and we are all over the United States. They monitor everybody and they tell, uh, for example, you have this and that and they com communicate with you. Uh, and nurses, it tries nurses will call you. Um, the questions are um, the artificial intelligence doctors, are they going to be replaced by uh, to replace the human doctors. It can. I can tell you in radiology it did almost. You know, most of the readings in radiology and you will see that there is a 98% accuracy in mammograms, 98 to 99% in CAT scans and so on. As Samir said, there is a huge amount of data. We don't know what to do with this data, but it is collected. It's waiting for somebody uh, to put this data together in order to reach a conclusion. It will assist in clinical practice, and I will show you how. It will assist in accuracy based on feedback for the treatment. It will give you up-to-date information. In the EMR, I'm sure many of you using it, when you write a medicine, immediately a flash comes the patient on this drug, it will interact with it. Are you sure you want to continue? you override it if you want. So this is all machine learning. It reduces the diagnostic and therapeutic errors. It improves and decreases the health risk alerts, and it will actually improve accuracy and assist in decision making. All these actually are going on nowadays. And these are where we are doing a lot actually. In 2016, most of the machine learning was in imaging, genetics, electrodiagnosing and so on. Mm. Uh, I'm going to skip genomics because we talked a lot about genomics because it's a huge amount. Um, the areas that taken most of the advances nowadays, as you could expect, is the diagnostic imaging because you put a lot of images and you read them, the machine can do that in no time. Electrodiagnosis is another one. You all know that an EKG can come up now with a report. It tells you what's going on. Genetic diagnosis, it is something huge. Clinical laboratory, mass screening, all are actually being used as part of machine learning. One of the areas that will advance is actually the genetic RNA and others, and it predict who will get a disease down the road based on that. And that's dangerous, by the way. In areas where they have insurance, they will insist they want your genetic data, then if you belong to that group that you might get a disease, they might not give you insurance. 
and this is one of the problems uh, we will face in the future. Again, this is the same, but I want, um, again, new plasmas, nervous, uh, nervous disease, cardiovascular, urogenital, pregnancy, digestive, all these nowadays having actually uh, artificial intelligence usage uh, in them. The biggest ones, new blast because of genetics and the others. So it diagnoses cancer, predict breast cancer, diagnose Parkinsonism disease, image analysis, chest x-ray report, and uh, diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease with 90% accuracy now. Classify patients or the cerebral ischemia, decide how to treat stroke, decide what is actually the best performance of the patient, how much TPA dose should give the patient to reduce bleeding, and predict three month outcome analyzing certain condition. Much better than a human being. 99% accuracy. So, this is a study actually we did here in, in our hospital. So we said we have a huge number of data. We have access to it, which is 40% of the hospital admission in the United States. Let's see if I can predict who will get amputation in patients who have diabetic foot ulcer or diabetes. And this is the first paper we did. It's actually uh, submitted and it's accepted for presentation, but we submitted publication direct. And this done by actually residents and statisticians with the help of the physician to tell them what we need. We looked at the data. I'm not going to go through it in details. A huge number of data, as you can see. We looked at the changes between people who get major amputation, minor amputation. We classified the data based on that, based on insurance, based on symptoms they have, based on associated conditions. See how much uh, data we put in. And then we found what are the 10 most important factors that contributed to amputation. And we gave them a covariant or odd number. And these are the factors. Gangrene, like if somebody comes with a gangrene stall, systemic infection, peripheral vascular disease, osteomyelitis, paralysis, and so on. And we weighed each one of them to determine what is the specificity, what is the accuracy of what we are looking at. We looked at the prediction, sensitivity, specificity of each one, and then we boosted it by 10 times to see if we can change the data. And then we came to the most important five factors, gangrene, osteomyelitis, systemic infection, peripheral vascular disease, and weight loss. So these are the most important ones. And then again, we weighed them again to make sure the data said, so this is the, the analysis as you can see. You start with one, Put all the combinations and see what is the risk. Then measure it by histogram. Try it again. Do it again. Third time. Then you do neural network. The first one, very simple. Then we did not like that. We want multiple lawyers, a third layer. And finally, we found these are the sensitivities for each one of those. And if the combination, and we have an app. This is the app. I'm not, yes. Uh, yes, this is the app. Hopefully it will work. It is published. Uh, it will be published soon. Um, give me a second. It will work. It takes a while to open. I think. So the app, you can use it in the clinic using the data, the huge number of data, the artificial intelligence we talked about. So if somebody coming with a diabetic foot ulcer, the chance of amputation probability 0.006. Let's say he had gangrene one area, because became 0.137, two times the one who has an ulcer only. Let's say he has osteomyelitis also. Now became 1.68 times diabetic foot ulcer and 99%. Systemic infection, four times. Let's say all of them. What will happen if we do all of them? These are the old factor. So this person will have seven times the possibility of an amputation compared to somebody who did not have them, and this person who have all those problems has a chance of almost 50% to be amputated. So this is artificial intelligence. So you put it in an app, the patient walks in the room, examine the patient, and tell him this is your chance of amputation. Perhaps we can change that if you help us change that. 
And this is what we call machine learning. Any question here? It's regarding the success in intervention radiology with uh, using AI, artificial intelligence, they have reached a stage that they are more accurate in diagnosing cancer with mammogram than actually intervention radiologists. Can we do this with vascular, uh, vascular angiogram? Can we have the same AI in vascular practice? Because I have a few experience maybe 10 years ago, but at the moment, there was no software or data collection systems that we have nowadays. So what's your opinion, uh, Munir? So I can tell you, for example, if you have a large number of data and you see a pathology, and then you want to say what is the best treatment, yes, it can be used. And it's coming. The paper that Ayman was talking about, prediction of healing using artificial intelligence. That's right. That's what it is. Prediction, if you uh, endovascularly open one vessel, two vessel, three vessel, is it the flow? What it is? We predicted actually healing in a huge uh, per, uh, percentage of patients compared to the human beings. There is no comparison even. And is your mobile app is freely available or you only have the access to it? No, once we have the publication. <laughs> we cannot publish. So it's going to JAMA. Once we publish it, hopefully it will be okay. And we, But it is available. I can send it to you. Uh, it's, uh, I can really share it with you one time. Uh, perhaps let me go back to it. You can actually write it now. Oh, that's very good. Uh, let me open the floor. Professor Ayman, uh, do you like to open the floor? It will give you what to do. And it will predict the healing if you do certain things in it. What am I going to do? Actually, we are working on three, four projects. One of them is healing of ulcers in patients with obesity. We are trying to, pre we found that obesity is actually preventive of amputation. We don't get amputation a lot with uh, obesity. So we are putting all the data now in the machine learning to see why. Is it the obesity or is it other factors with it? So this is where machine learning helps. So it helps in the decision making and reading and suggesting a treatment for those patients. It will help a lot, yes. Remember, vascular surgery is vascular medicine. It's not only surgery. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Thank you. I, I think Dr. Mark But you know, the answer, first of all, you know, Zuckerberg and his friends collect data about you. That did not stop you from using Facebook or Twitter or WhatsApp and everything else. We know they are doing that. So the need in the future will dictate your use. That is the problem. So it's coming whether we like it or not even coming. It is there actually now. But as physicians, as surgeons, we should jump into this and adopt it to contribute and fine tune it rather than just be the, the the uh, receiving end in it only. And at the end, I will tell you what I will suggest, actually. I, I'm not giving just a lecture to tell you information. There will be suggestion at the end. Okay, Dr. Munir, yeah. I have two questions from people. Put that score in a machine, then it becomes predictive. But it's still not at that stage yet. That's the difference. The um, And that applies to any of those scores we are using. For Glasgow Coma School is another one. We actually decided, somebody sat and decided based on the statistics, these are the important ones, but perhaps it was limitation of the human being at that time. If you put the device or the data in a machine, you might get a different Glasgow Thomas scale, a different scale. Okay, before we go to Dr. Sammer. Can they learn, can they improve themselves by themselves without human input? As you, as I said, actually, you have to have a human input. So, for example, if some data is not important, somebody has to come and change it. No, but I did, uh, but I meant, uh, Munir, like, I mean, like now self-driving cars, if they made a wrong turn and was, they may have an accident, they can teach the, all other cars that there is a wrong turn, so nobody will do it in the future. That's what I meant. Yeah. So, so can the machine do that? The machines, but it has to be done by a human being. It has to go to a center for medicine because a medicine is not a map. Uh, and I'm coming to that actually also some of the problem with these issues because all depends on the data and the interpreter. Okay, Dr. Munir, 
all different. Medicine is different. For example, um, if you put a million uh, data in a patient and then you forgot to say this patient has hypertension, for example. So your prediction is useless. So all depends what you put. Like in the car, I tell you what is one of the problem: a driverless car. When there's an accident in the driverless car because somebody decided six hours ago to put a partition like um, a detour, an accident happened. So whose mistake now? Is it the car? No, is but. But but the car can tell the other cars not to do the same mistake. What I'm saying, yes, they can yeah, do that. It does that now. It does that in GPS. When you drive in California, for example, it tells you this road is all red. Go another road to avoid problems. Yeah, it does that. But in medicine, I don't think we reach that stage yet. Other than give you information, and you can override that information as a physician. You can. Okay, you can continue, uh, my dearest uh, Munir. Was actually. A human, there's the difference between the humans and technology. I'm not going to go through that. There is the human touch in the human intelligence. There is no uh, emotional touch in in the in the robot, but it works very well. Uh, and in vascular Magellan is a very good example, but it is very expensive. That's the problem. It's about two million dollars to have one Magellan to do angiograms for you. And I tried it. We did not buy it, but we tried it. Uh, usually, human beings want more answers. In 2030, we need more answers on the patient and the implication of those answers. Um, it is like a driverless car in a jam city. Can you really imagine to drive a driverless car in New Delhi or in Cairo or any of those? Nobody follows the rules. So this is the issue with machines. You have to have very well set rules to be safe. Driverless car is a very good example of it. The same as computers. Um, teams have to work together. There is an impact of failure. What happens? Whose mistake if there's a failure? If somebody dies from a decision, is it the one who programmed it? Is it the one who put the in, information in it, is it the problem with the person who override that information? So these are issues not resolved yet. Um, and I said that driverless car accident, for example, breast cancer diagnosis by mammogram, 72% by machine learning, 65% uh, more than a uh, human, which is uh, by 7% more. But who is accurate? Is it the human or the machine learning? You are comparing the breast image reading to whom? To the human reading. But once you get the data in it and you get a higher chance, this is cancer, but the human says, no, it is not. So whom you are going to learn? This is a major decision. It is, it is for example, going removing the breast now, perhaps, or doing a surgery. Is the patient going to believe the machine or to believe the human? These are the things that are uh, really a lot uh, we need to talk about. And this is what Samir was talking about. Uh, when the GPS, driver's car depends on GPS, especially 5G down the road, so if there's an accident, whose mistake? It is the GPS who did not fill it, or it is the one who started it. There are a lot of obstacles in the research, of course. Data exchange. Can I exchange the data with another company? Uh, does not provide incentive to sharing data at all. Even if you look, for example, in here, in this hospital, or other hospitals around me, five, six places, they have different EMRs. They don't share data. Not only that, there are three hospitals have Cerner, which is one of the EMR, and each one of those is different than the other, and they don't share data. We are part of IntelliCure, which is a wound service EMR. They share data, but to get the shared data, I have to pay money. So these are all issues for the future. Do you trust the clinician or the machine? It's a black box. How can you trust it? 
um, deep learning uh, also can be deeper. So if three layers gave you a better answer, why should I go with three layers? Why not 10 layers? Um, but it needs a lot of work. Lack of interpretability, sometimes you cannot. Technical problems in the machine, what will happen? Potential error in the, also in the machine can be a problem. Are we going to be obsolete as surgeons? Most probably not. Um, although robotic surgery replaced a lot of the surgeons actually on the side of the patient, it did not replace the surgeon completely. This is again by Schwab. This is the part for a human profession or the uh, uh, automation with the humans. Mental health, a chance to be replaced very long. Uh, chief executive law, sales manager's law, because you need somebody to do the talking and talk to the human, convince, etc. Computer system analysis, these are the law. Psychologists, imagine if you are talking to a machine as your psychiatrist. So these things will not happen. Physicians and surgeons are also low, but they are not very low, lower than others at least. Jump the job automation is very important, complex problem solving, it can work very well, a lot of data can work very well. The ethics is a problem, the ethics of data and privacy, the ethics of morality and algorithm, the ethics of values and practices. 20 years ago, if we told you there will be medical records that tells you what to do, you will say you are crazy, they are there. You know, whoever read the book from about Google, I read it, it's a very nice book. I suggest everybody should read it, how Google works. So how Google works, they said, we have to have two types of future plans. They call them moonshots and roof shots. Roof, the one on top of you. The roof shots solve all the problems around you as you go. But have a goal, which is moonshot, that everybody thinks you are crazy. It will never happen, like the driverless car. And they say the moonshot will happen. It takes five to 10 years if you keep working on it. The roof shots, if you keep working on it, it takes only a few days or weeks. So when they asked them, do we have all this data? What shall we do with it? They said, I don't know. The machine will figure it out. So exactly where we are now, machine will figure it out. Um, we expect uh, that the workflow will be done by a machine. It's already done by a machine, actually. The workflow done by, I don't call patients now, Athena calls patients for me. We put the, the time for the patient to come, they receive a call, two to three days or a week, you have an appointment with Dr. So-and-so, don't forget the appointment, then another reminder. This is workflow automation. Triaging will be done also in the future by machines, uh, digital assistance will be also billing, uh, clinical data collection, all by machines. Um, a check follow-up will be machine. We call them, how are you doing? We want to make sure everything is good. Imaging, we said by machines. My prediction, we are not going to go anywhere unless something happens with the satellites. Medical assistance will be mostly machines. In integration of service will be machines. Registration, appointment will be all machines. Physician, surgeon will not be obsolete, but will be assisted by machines. And we don't know when. What about in vascular? So far, we can predict who will get peripheral arterial disease. We can predict amputation. We can predict management. We can predict which patient based on genes, hypertension, smoking, will get an aneurysm. We can predict the progression of the aneurysm. So we can decide whom to fix, whom not to fix. Amputation prediction I showed you, we already there. Ulcer healing, we have actually another uh, project we are going with for ulcer healing now. The stroke treatment is already proven, endovascular intervention by uh, Magellan is being done. You just write your line and sit on the chair. Um, even if the patient comes with certain uh, factors like uh, how long the legion, how small the legion, how much money he has, does he have insurance? And they put all together, will tell you, do that open, do that endo. Education, we are doing it now. The medical office nowadays is like this. It's not my office, by the way. And this is the future medical office. It's a machine, somebody running everybody for you, uh, sitting somewhere. Education, 
we are not going to do ourselves any favor if we don't educate our students, our residents, ourselves, that the future of writing and reading the same as in computers, it will be machine learning for the future. We have to, te to teach them all these things. So I, and artificial intelligence is a reality, either we lead or obsolete. So this is my actually slide, my suggestions. I think we need to join to get data as much as possible one way or another. Education is a very way, good way of doing it. People who are interested to be part of machine learning, but they need to have a huge data with them, like if their hospitals want to join these machine learning issues, they can. Each a large number of teams, they should employ a statistician to help them do the machine learning. And the most important thing really, don't say no when technology tells you I can do this. Say yes, tell me how. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. That my